So, hi, Linda. Hi, Tom <laughs> Linda's, uh Linda was my boss when I uh, worked in city hall and city government, um, and she's still my boss at Bloomberg Associates. And um, so, so, Linda, you, you worked in government, in New York City government, for more than 30 years. Was it 33 years? Mm -hmm. Something like that? So you started uh -huh. when you were 10 years old, mm -hmm. obviously. <laughs> and um, it, it, you, you worked in several different sectors within health and human services. And um, can you just talk a little bit about how you use data in your different roles to drive change in your government career? Sure. So, um, so hi, everybody. Nice to be here. And um, so when I did work um, many decades in New York City government. Most of that, the, the, um, about 18 years, was in the health and human services sector. I started um, in our child welfare agency. The city of New York manages directly the child welfare system, foster care and prevention. Um, and then I became the commissioner of homeless services um, when Mike Bloomberg became mayor, and then um, his deputy mayor for health and human services after that. And so I had both kind of that frontline experience working in agencies, then running an agency, then moving to City Hall. And I think um, the first thing I would say is that I'm a real um, operational person. I like to understand how the nuts and bolts of systems work. And so I really, in some ways, my favorite job was actually um, as commissioner of homeless services because I was running an operation, but I was also in charge. You know, you get to City Hall and they think, oh, you're the deputy mayor, you're so powerful. No, you gotta like beg the commissioners to do stuff for you, right? You know, you gotta get them to agree. So, um, so I think in some ways the commissioner position was the one where I felt the most control over the environment that I was working in. And, um, and I just found um, the, for me, understanding um, how to make reform. Mike was great. He said, you know, our job is, you know, of course go in, support what's working, but why we're really there is to fix what's not working. So he gave us this mandate for reform. And looking at agencies, especially something as complex as homeless services, where there's different programs, people are scattered across dis different agencies, um, and then there's the, the central operation support. Understanding how all of those pieces work individually, but then how they interrelate to each other is critical if you want to think about systems change. You know, we talked about the workforce and, you know, the, um, the people um, challenge and, um, and the, um, I think uh, um, Professor Lino set it up here. It's you know the people challenge, the po process and policy challenge, and then the um, the, the platform challenge. Um, so thinking about all of those moving parts, to me the thing that was really really crucial in um, in my ability to um, tr understand and track how all of these individual components were actually a single living organism working together was to understand the data flow across all those divisions. When I started at Homeless Services, a job, by the way, that my closest advisor told me not to take because it would be a career ender, mm -hmm. I'm like, OK, yes, Mike, I'll do it. Um, when I started, it was really in dysfunction. And a huge part of the process there was just getting people to not just not describe how their process worked, but to give me evidence of how it worked and then to track it over time. And so moving, um, having a routine report about what was going on and getting it refreshed all the time, we would do um, twice a week, 8 a.m., all team reviews where we would walk through the data and if something was going up, like red, you know, red alert going up, we would stop and we would talk as a group. So it wasn't just talking to that single deputy about what was going on, but it was talking to the whole group, both you know the handoffs, the hand twos, and the handoffs, and getting the group to work as a team and thinking about both why improvements were happening. Sometimes, like out of nowhere, you, you know, you'd have this huge turnaround or this big drop that you weren't expecting. Hey, what's going on there? And then the ability for people to talk about it was really critical to understanding whether the efforts, the things that we were doing, was successful in helping the, um, to improve our services, um, but also for people to understand how they needed to work together to do that, that it wasn't on one person. Great, thank you. And so let's, let's get into some of the um, kind of concrete examples. Can you, can you give 
an example or examples of, of where you use data to really uh, drive system change and really collaboration around data? Well, and, and one of my favorite stories was um, the work that we did in juvenile justice reform. So we had this, we were so lucky we got this really great commissioner of probation, Vinnie Chiraldi, who's now running um, for Westmore, who's our, the new governor of, um, of Maryland. He's now running state corrections in, in Maryland. So, but Vinny is, um, um, came in as our probation commissioner, and he had this real passion, um, you know, fire in his belly to reform juvenile justice services in New York. We were detain arresting way too many kids, detaining way too many kids, incarcer convicting and incarcerating too many kids. And we had a report that told us if a kid did one stay, in a juvenile placement facility, which is essentially um, incarceration for kids, if they did one stay, the chance that they will be rearrested, reconvicted, and replaced was 89%. So we knew putting them in there was a guarantee that they would be back. And that wasn't even looking at the adult system. And so we're do we the numbers were large, and the outcomes were atrocious. And we were destroying their lives, clearly. Um, and so Vinny started a conversation about, well, we have to do this different. Okay, so we have probation, there's supervised kids in the community. Um, we had a juvenile detention agency um, re and a, uh, responsible just for managing the um, pre-trial um, detention of kids. The state actually managed the placement. So once the kids were convicted, then they went up upstate New York somewhere and under state supervision. Our law department were the prosecutors legal aid, where um, the defense attorneys, um, and then the judges that, you know, everybody's afraid of the judges, nobody knew how to bring them into the room. And so it was a real challenge if we wanted to achieve this, this really challenging ambition, we needed to get all these players who were parts of that, of that whole ecosystem, we needed to get them all at the reform table together. So I'm like, okay, I'm just the deputy mayor. I'm like, okay, this is fun, let's do this, right? So I invite everybody to the meeting and all hell broke loose. I mean, it's like finger pointing, egos, fights that they didn't even remember who, remember who started the fight. They just remembered that I hate you and I hate your agency too. And, and it was um, like the acrimony was intense. And I'm like, okay, cool, 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 cool. Um, next meeting, there's so many, you're just so, fights about like just the facts. Let's just get the facts straight. Everybody bring your data to the next meeting. The next meeting, then they had a brawl about the data. That's wrong. I don't know how you're counting. That's not the right number of kids. That's not the right length of stay. That's wrong. And so then they bickered about the data. And so I said, okay, cool, 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 cool. And I'm like, let's, let's talk, let's figure out why the data is not talking to each other. And so we started to actually put, um, the pieces, the flow, these eight or 10 agencies that all saw themselves doing a separate mission, they in fact started to see, understand that they were part of a single flow and that something that happened way upstream had huge repercussions further down. And then this amazing transformation started to happen where in the challenge of trying to get a single data story about what was going on with those young people, they started to understand each other's system and processes, and then started getting into the deeper conversations about why things were happening like, as they were happening. And it, and it set the found, almost the beginning of a sense of, we're not a bunch of warring factions, we are in fact a single family. And it started to open up the conversation around a shared mission and a, an objective, which was super clear that we wanted better outcomes for these young people, we were destroying their lives, and that any touch of the justice system on their lives was producing a worse outcome for them. And so the more we could do with interventions, community-based, home-based prevention and intervention, the better we would do, do at saving their lives and making communities safer. My favorite story in all of this, the, the person who was representing the police department later confessed to me that his job, when he got assigned to go do this, uh, sit at this table, his job was to make sure I didn't screw it up for the police department. You know, keep an eye on her, you know, you don't know what she's gonna do. She's gonna release all these, like, you know, kids to the community, or they're gonna mess up our good work. And he 
became an incredible advocate for change and really thinking about how to work effectively and helping officers to solve problems without arrest, right? And giving them, and then with probation, and we figured out how to, how to invest in the right array of services. So again, we needed data to disaggregate the population because there were a lot of safety issues. And so we needed to know which kids needed no touch, they just needed to go home to their parents, which kids needed effective community-based services, and then how many kids did need to be detained because the circumstance and the community safety issues just mandated that. Which, by the way, was like 5%, right? So the data in that circumstance was kind of the start of the glue that helped this group of disparate warring factions actually feel like a coherent whole and start to act like a coherent whole. So, okay, so, so let me actually, so that's, that's interesting. So it seems like the collaborations that were intended originally to, to address data sharing turned into kind of solution generation and programmatic and system reforms. Can you, can you give us some uh, examples about how that worked? Well, you know, and I think that, um, I think that maybe the upside down way of, say, to, of telling that story is that if we had just launched into a, um, we think too many kids' lives are being destroyed through the arrest and incarceration. We want to build community-based services. So let's, it's almost um, um, Professor um, um, Linus about, um, you know, if we just threw, threw a bunch of new um, interventions in there and said, let's go with them. Number one, the team wouldn't have bought in. And you really, you needed the judges to trust it. You needed the, um, the, the prosecuting attorneys to trust it. Um, and you needed the, the community to trust it. Um, and so in a way, um, starting with, you know, in the back of our mind, we knew there were these great evidence-based services, but if we started just by dropping them in the environment, they wouldn't have had um, the, cha the same chance of success. Instead, they grew out of this iterative process where everybody had a chance to, to, to play a role and see their part and, and change um, bits and pieces of the entire process such that then they were clamoring, hey, I've got more kids that could benefit from that service. How come we don't have it in Queens yet, right? Then they were pressuring the group to put the service in place, right? And so it was, you know, and, and it's clearly not just about the data, right? Yep. But for me, in this process, and I've seen it, and was when I was in child welfare, when I was running homeless services, when I was facilitating this collaborative group, um, the data almost became kind of the clarifying facts that because people trusted the data, they had been part of the process of putting it together, they relied on, it became kind of our grounding back to, well, let's go, all right, stop fighting. Let's go back to the data. What does the data tell us? And it helped us to resolve a lot of conversations and move things to the next level. So you had this, this, um, these amazing processes to, to collaborate and share data. Um, and do you have examples of, of what any kind of reforms that came out of that, uh, that kind of structure? In the juvenile system? A seventy-five percent drop in the number of kids in juvenile detention, mm -hmm. which and we of course here's a sad part of the story. We couldn't get the state to come to the table. So one of the things, it's a, actually it's a great story because we said, all right, state, if you don't want to come to the table, give us the kids. And so we actually got a state law passed that um, moved juvenile placement out of state hands to the city. Right? Yes. Do that. <laughs> do that. We need to do it. Um, and so and and then we brought them home instead of shipping them to you know some. Um, barren place in upstate New York, where I'm from. Um, um, we brought them and we did the, we, um, we built the right number of juvenile facilities in New York City, which is, you know, by the way, a total of around 100 beds instead of 3,000 that they had upstate New York. Um, and, um, and so, but the state would never come to the table. So it's really interesting. We reduced juvenile detention um, by, in, and it was like this, it turned around, what, what kind of change, a 65% drop in two years. It was so quick, it was amazing. But then what happened is we actually, it took another five or six years before all this placement came down um, to, under city control, but without having any conversations with the state, the juvenile placement numbers dropped by 40%. And so it was just the knock-on effect of the upstream changes. And so it's also the, the power of when you do this kind of system reform that it's, you know, when you see it as a system, you understand 
how much you're preventing and you're pulling people out of the pipeline and, and giving more alternatives and building confidence of the system, of the collective bodies, that these alternatives will work. Great. So, so OK. Um, I want to acknowledge that Linda has to be at the airport at uh, 2 o'clock. So we're going we're gonna to end the session a little bit and early. And it is in DC. And it is in DC. <laughs> oh. Right? And, and also allow you an opportunity to get to lunch. Right? So is there anything else you want to add? Well, one, here's, um, I would love, actually, I would love to take a couple of minutes and just hear if anybody has similar stories that they want to share about experiences in, in your um, cities. But I, I had this, I was trying to think of a metaphor, and I found a metaphor that I really like. Um, you know, um, um, I really like doctor shows, hospital shows, right? I love them, right? And, and I was thinking about the patient is on the monitors, and you've got the patient, you've got the heart. They're testing the heart and the, and the pulse and the breathing and everything. And I thought data, like, data that is describing the work that we do is like monitoring the patient. And there's lots of different readings, and you're constantly watching it, right? And so like, if the patient flatlines, you jump in and you do something. If, you know, if everything's fine, then, you know, I, no, you can never look away, never look away from the patient. But I thought, and this is another, another point um, that was made earlier about the importance of constantly refreshed data. Like, you can't, like, check in on the patient once a year and see how they're doing. You can't check in on them once a month. I think real-time data is so critically important. And I like that, you know, so because I like doctor shows and, you know, maybe I want to be a surgeon, I don't know. I really like that concept of, um, of the monitoring of the patient with the constant data and the group of, of, of everybody, all hands on deck, to understand what's going on and follow it. So I'm just, I'm, I don't know, does that work? And do you, are there kind of examples of, of this that work for your cities? I have an example. Actually, I, so I, right, give us an example. In, in our in our in our work in Mexico City, uh, the uh, you know the the city actually didn't know how many people were living on the street, rough sleeping, uh, experiencing homelessness, and um, and so just the the kind of I think of it as kind of a triggering mechanism, the the act of going out and um, so and so Michael Bloomberg mentioned this. Kind of the, the, the act of going out and actually counting people on the street. And it I just want to correct, we did not dress them up as neighbors. <laughs> they looked kind of like neighbors support. because they were college students, but you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Otherwise he got it pretty right. You know, okay. <laughs> and um, so so Mexico City, you know, had this idea for a strategic plan, but they didn't really have a, a, a way of measuring the challenge. And so we, you know, we got them together and we came up with a system. It's a vast city, first of all. It's about three times the geographic size of, of New York City. And so we came up with this methodology to go out and you know, uh, identify areas and, and sample those areas and extrapolate it to the larger city. Um, and, uh, but but it was, we got the police involved. We got the youth agency involved. And we, we got community members and uh, charity providers to, you know, involved as well. And what ended up happening is the city kind of put out this, you know, this report of the magnitude of the problem. And they asked many questions in the survey about where did people come from and why did you end up on the street and, you know, what are the circumstances. And, um, and then and that sort of kind of generated some, some energy around the, the issue. And it also put the city in a position where they had to, to generate solutions it, it, as well. There was a willingness right? of accountability. <laughs> and you know yep. what I loved about that? Um, the com I'm, I'm sorry, but this is really <laughs> the competition that started happening across boroughs. We have five major geographic um, subdivisions in the city. And suddenly, it's like, like everybody's like, what's Queens doing? How come they're doing so good? And then like the Bronx is like, oh, we got to beat Queens next year. And so the data can actually create an uh, environment of healthy competition. And it's, I mean, it's a, it's a conversation starter, and in, in, in Mexico City, at least, you know, the agencies that weren't talking to each other before, you could go to the youth agency and say, um, look at how many youth are actually living on the street. And, you know, and we really, and, and here are the areas of the city where they're experiencing homelessness, and, you know, how could we better uh, craft solutions to address this issue? And you would really start to, it was a conversation starter to bring in other agencies and really kind of break down these silos. 
and, and eventually they you know, generated a strategic uh, plan and they had uh, you know, a metric, a baseline measure to, to, to use to, uh, to track accountability over time as well. Well, that's our story. We're sticking to it. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your um, session here. It's really great, and it's great to be in communion with all of you around this issue. Yeah. Great.